presenting the Boeing 747-8F. This freighter will be included in a soon-to-be-released update 2.2 to the SSG 747-8 Intercontinental V2. Welcome to Flight Brothers FT, produced by Tim and Lee. Plan the flight and fly the plan. All charts courtesy of Navigraph Charts, not to be used for real-world navigation. Be sure to subscribe and explore the rest of the channel for high-quality aviation content and entertainment. Welcome to this pre-release look at the 748F for the SSG 748V2. We were generously granted a look at this work in progress by SSG and we are pleased with the results. Thanks again to the SSG team for providing this pre-release to us. Before we get into the details, let's take a second to see where this aircraft falls in the production line. A few years ago, SSG released a 748 Intercontinental version 1, which included a freighter. Later, a V2 was sold with greatly improved features and systems and the V1 product was removed. The initial V2 release did not have a freighter, but SSG did promise to include it free to purchasers in a future update. This is a pre-release beta of that promised update. First, let's take a look at the textures. The SSG 748 Freighter has a very high quality model that really reflects the beauty and sleekness of this enormous Boeing. If you load up the Laminar Default 744 for comparison, you can really appreciate how much smoother and better modeled this 748 is. You can also see many more shots of this aircraft and quite a few others on our Instagram account at FlightFT2019. The SSG textures are very high quality and they hold up even when you zoom in, which I highly suggest you do. The aircraft is so large that the fixed viewpoint is uh, quite a ways out and you will miss just how good the textures are until you look in. The smaller details, such as landing gear, flight control surfaces, etc., are shown in remarkably good detail. For example, if you check out the complexity of the underside of the slats, it's very impressive. You will also notice that you have a multi-surface rudder, and that's especially noticeable before you power on the hydraulics. Our pre-release came with eight freighter liveries and six intercontinental liveries, including House SSG and two Boeing House liveries as well. That's right, Sim Captains. This is not just the freighter. This version 2.2 update also includes the Intercontinental. All are of high quality and detail. Both models benefit from updated textures and animations, such as the rivets around the APU tail cone and an engine windmilling effect. So expect to see that if you have any wind at your ramp location. The changes to the passenger model are mostly in systems. So the addition of the F model and its animations are probably the most striking feature in this update. So let's see what we get. The EFB shows all the available animated doors and the GPU option. Each cargo door moves realistically slow, so don't expect the nose to open in five seconds. All the locking mechanisms are shown in high detail. I was an owner of the original version one, uh, version two as well. And V1 did not have the cargo displayed in the cargo variant. We have another video on that channel. Maybe we'll go ahead and link that in here for you to take a look at. However, that's one feature added to V2. Isn't that right, Tim? Right. The cargo is actually displayed inside this aircraft. Uh, it is a fixed texture, so it is not going to vary with your payload. So even if you set it to be an empty ship, you will still see it in there. One nice surprise for users of the SSG is you have the full cargo bay rendered. Uh, you can walk the entire length, I suggest you do, and make sure you have about five minutes to do it. Many people have complained previously about not having a full passenger cabin on the Intercontinental, so interestingly enough, SSG has given you the full deck and even some varied cargo near the doors where you're most likely to see it. In the center of the uh, cargo bay, it's pretty much all the same boxes. While not functional, you also get control stations for the cargo doors and they're modeled where they should be, right by the cargo bay doors. There were also added improvements to the animations for the engine spool up and shutdown in this version. Operation complete. Hit parking brake. 
The upper deck has been changed to reflect the crew accommodations on the freighter. In our pre-release, the cockpit has a curtain instead of a door. It doesn't open, you simply walk through it. The doors to the crew rest bunks are left and right, and the cargo access ladder is also just a pass-through. All the crew areas have a nice level of detail and good texturing. The main cargo deck is uh, impressive in its own right, with detailed textures on the wall for each cargo position. And as I mentioned before, walking the cargo deck really gives you uh, a sense of the 748's massive size. It takes quite a while to walk, even if you're using the, uh, I call it the run feature, holding down shift when trying to walk the length of it. And amusingly enough, when you get to the rear door, you will find there is a very nice unbadged, what appears to be a Nissan 370Z, and that is going to be transported on all of your 748 freighter trips. The sounds on this model seem unchanged, and that's certainly not a complaint for us. The 748's F-Mod has always seemed quite realistic, and we find it to be satisfying both internally and in the external views. You know, Tim, I'm glad they threw the 370Z in there because nothing would irritate me more than hopping on my brand new 747-8, flying to a beautiful location somewhere in the world, and having to call an Uber. <laughs> there you so go. we've got it. The only trick Let's is just... getting it down from there. That is exactly what I was going to say. You read my mind. Well... SSG uses the EFB as the main interface for its custom features. Uh, it has a simplistic presentation, but it's quite easy to use for uh, loading, for operating the doors and setting adjustments. I had this complaint earlier in our, um, was that our second video, I think, Tim, when the V2 came out, that some of the click regions are, were a little tight for my liking. However, those are noted on the bug tracker that SSG has established in the xplane.org forums. We'll go ahead and link that in the video description below. Um, I think one other addition that may add value, and this is just us talking, would be adding Avatab compatibility to it. It works really well, but it's always nice to have those charts since you have the screen there anyway. Right. Now, I think that's, that's really what gets you is uh, we've all gotten so used to having that tablet in that captain's position that when you look at it you can't help but feel that it should have Avatab functions because so many of the other paywares and the Zebo already do. All right so um, there have been a number of systems and procedures and FMS tweaks added here. Uh, most of those are provided to us in a list and we went trying to hunt down as many of them as we could. And here's some of the more interesting ones. Um, so of the tweaks and improvements that they've given us, you've got about 25 upgrades or fixes that are coming along. And uh, it's a good sign because it shows SSG is really taking all of the customer feedback and has been working to improve this product. So touring through the upgrades here, one of the things they've added, the yaw damper systems are now isolated into the upper and lower. You've always had switches for both, but previously they were just ganged together. Now that they have unlinked them, they've even added the appropriate ICAST messages to show you which one is not currently active. Yeah, and they've also updated the comm radios. So now they reflect the 8.33 kHz frequency separation. So now you actually get down to the thousands place. Uh, the 748 also has a keypad entry for the frequencies. So this is kind of unique among Boeings that typically have the the knob with the inner and outer for the uh, main megahertz and then the uh, kilohertz frequencies. The transponder input is also listed as improved, though I don't think uh, either of us really had any issues with that in a prior version. The 747 has three FMCs, for those of you unfamiliar with the layout. Of course, you have one at the captain and first officer and one on the pedestal. It's been given a sample display, making it appear on, so it's not just dark. Uh, SSG says they've not implemented its features in this version, again, 2.2. So we could assume it may make it into some type of functionality, although that is not certain and that is not confirmed or rumored from SSG at this time. Right. And quite honestly, 
who in the heck needs a third FMC on a sim plane? But whatever, it's there. If they make it work, <laughs> I'll be I'll be thrilled to have it. I'll just have two of them on uh, progress screen. <laughs> I, I gotta have Netflix go on that one. Yeah, <laughs> just <laughs> I don't know what I'm gonna do with it. All right. So uh, speaking of the FMC, that is where quite a few of the little changes and bug fixes have been implemented. Uh, one new feature is the display of the SIDS and STARS on the nav display as previews with a white dashed line. This is a feature of the real 748. Improvements have also been made to the step climb input, the approach speed computations, and now a warning is displayed if the nav database is not installed. And I had to snicker when I saw that because I'm one of the fools when I initially installed the 2.0 who didn't have the mm -hmm. nav database in correctly and it gave me endless problems, but that was my own fault. So Yeah, I think you had to go into like the UPMD folder or something like that. Right, right yeah. The, it was user yeah. error. You know what fixed it? When I bought the SSG eJets, I actually like read the manual and installed it correctly and then all of my SSGs worked properly, so... <laughs> yeah, read the manual, guys. That? All right, so uh, speaking of the FMC, as we flew this, our own testing has given us some mixed results. Now, if this never occurred to you, Flight Brothers FT, we're not actually brothers, if you didn't know that, and we don't right. live together, and we don't fly the same um, sim PCs. So there's two separate systems running this. Now, on my That's system... That's not totally true. Sometimes when I'm over at your house or we're doing live streams, we do. Right, pre-COVID, we, yeah, we would smash in office. here and sit with my little tiny monitor. <laughs> That's right. Where do we get the webcam function going, guys? Uh, so, um, but as I tried it on my system, I was mm -hmm. super pleased. The FMC ran smoother than it did on 2.0. Uh, I, I found it to be a much cleaner operation during the input. I remember the 2.0 used to kind of hang for me a little when I was putting things in. Uh, and sometimes I found these like weird ghost lines at the end of the plan. I wasn't noticing that this time. Oh uh, yeah. And uh, also in operation, it seemed to work great. And uh, the thing that impressed me the most is during my test flights, when I made changes, it recomputed and everything was fine. And that is normally where custom FMC fails for me. Is like, yeah, if you set it up the way their manual says for for anybody's. I'm not talking about specifically SSGs. You know, sure. you'll probably be fine. But as soon as uh, if you're on VATSIM and you get rerouted, then you're trying, you know, sometimes it just can't recover. I didn't have any mm -hmm. issues with that. So, Lee, I know that was not your experience with this uh, beta. Tell us how yours went. Right, yeah. Um, there's a reason why you beta test before you put a product out there. And I had uh, what Tim referred to as a more beta testing experience. So... I had a few crash to desktops with mine. And of course, with each time, anytime you have a software failure or hang up, especially with the X plane, the devs always want to see the X plane log so they can sort through it. So uh, on the crashes, I sent that in and uh, our point of contact over there and part of the team have been sending it out and they've been addressing issues. So, I enjoy the aircraft and it performs beautifully until it gets hung up. So it's kind of odd, you know, like you said, Tim, yours ran perfectly smooth. Um, I'm two for five. Uh, I've got two flights out of the five. However, this is why we test. Um, each, each test hopefully involves the product. I don't know how big the beta team is, but hopefully when we reach a full version 2.2, rather than people go, when's it coming out? And then, they release this and then chaos breaks on the internet. Uh, they'll have a finished product. Right. So again, just remind everybody, this is a pre-release. Uh, it's still in testing. They're still messing with it. They've actually responded to us on some of uh, Lee's reports sent in and we just sent him a fresh one today. Yep. So um, I guess the last uh, thing just really to talk about is flight dynamics and um, we have to say we find it believable. Now, neither Lee or I has ever flown a 747 or a 747 800, certainly not. Um, you know, the only thing I've been behind the controls of is a Cessna 172. But that said, of all the sim planes I've flown, it seemed very believable 
in the dynamics and it does seem to line up with what uh, actual captains have said about 747s so to all the people on the internet who have said things like they fly like an f-16 I, I think you're silly so in general 747s are known to be very stable ships they're extremely large they have a huge amount of control authority the inertia of such a large aircraft can be a little tricky in a landing configuration so if you are not stable and you're not lined up don't expect you're gonna just slide it over super easy it's too big but its size also kind of helps you out uh, minor crosswinds not a problem for something the size of a small ocean liner the biggest handling difference that we find with 747s this one or even the default laminar to compare with other aircraft it's the incredible amount of available thrust. It's very easy on a takeoff roll, particularly if you have a uh, light load, to turn into mm -hmm. a rocket, <laughs> go practically vertical, and break the 250 knots speed limit below 10,000 because you just have so much thrust on this. So uh, it seems SSG has done a good job modeling it. It's a very good hand flyer. I've done... Um, probably an hour of hand flying at low altitude i i won't bother telling you the circumstances for that right now but it was enjoyable <laughs> <laughs> it was lee's fault hey, you know oh yeah that's right yeah i remember that one you know one other thing to keep in mind too is obviously at uh, what nearly 800 900 thousand pounds i don't know what that is in kilos let's i don't know let's call it uh divide 400. by 2.2 right yeah so um you know, if it can, if that wing can lift that, subtract two or three hundred thousand pounds in fuel consumed, and then you're going to have that massive problem with a little bit of thrust adjustment on a final approach with those massive flaps could, uh, you know, really affect the final approach course if you're not set up. So speed control, again, very important. Right, right. Yeah. Stabilized approach is always important on an airliner and, you know, as a function of scale, this is scaled up. So uh, a small mistake times the size of this aircraft, it's going to add up. And if you don't know, you did a video on it. Bam. Go watch it, guys. All right. So um, an interesting thing came up here. SSG really does, and I, I do believe they're dedicated to this. It seems to be a mission. Um, they really want to make this very deep complex accurate systems and it occurred to me while talking to Lee earlier today that you could quite accidentally as a user encounter a high level of system depth and think it's a bug so here's my example today I loaded up the intercontinental um, it wasn't quite at the gate I wanted and rather than reloading I just used the map function and I slid the aircraft over after I did that it starts rolling backwards and I'm like what so I tap the brakes it doesn't stop when inside pull the parking brake it doesn't stop and maybe three weeks ago I would have thought up oh, there's another bug in this beta the parking brake doesn't work what's going on here and then I remembered a week or two ago I watched a Metro pilot video where he's uh, debriefing a situation where there's a video on the internet of a Q400 that's a, a runaway on the ramp. It's it's was not chalked and somehow the the brakes had slipped. So he was talking about uh, you know the hydraulic loss on the brake system and that you know the ship has to be chalked because no matter how good the hydraulic system is, it's eventually going to bleed out its pressure and that parking brake is going to fail. So mm -hmm. with that in the back of my mind as my 748 slowly careening down the tarmac I uh, I went inside quickly powered up the systems got the hydraulics online and what do you know the parking brake worked then so I was like wow they simulated hydraulic loss that's awesome but if I hadn't watched that mentor pilot or wasn't thinking about it I could see someone blowing up the internet going oh it's trash blah blah the parking brake doesn't even work um and, and lee you found another one something with the radios yeah with the radios uh, a lot of times when we boot x plane uh, com one most frequently used is already on so you switch it to your local atis and you hear it mm -hmm. that's not the case again on this and 
I don't know if it would be on a post-flight checklist where you would turn it off. It might be. But if you dial up your radio, you really need to look down there. And uh, I can't remember if you push it or pull it. But anywhere there's like your knob volume control, you need to turn that on. Because if you dial up ATIS on your COM1 and you don't depress that button and activate it, you'll sit there going, why isn't it working? It's, it matches the chart. The map, the frequency matches. It's not working. It's a bug. So right, we have to be we have to be careful what we wish for when we want systems depth, but also as quote sim pilots or captains, we really do need to know our ships, um, just like the real world. You know, otherwise you end up with um, incorrect reporting of of issues. Know your ship. That, that's a good t-shirt i like it uh what know your ship <laughs> know your ship and you don't how know about, ship that would be a good t-shirt i know my ship <laughs> uh well, yeah yeah no, that's the never-ending battle between um you know the very vocal crowd of we want study level and then probably your more casual average uh guys we have a real heart for the newbie flight simmer that's actually a lot of why we started this channel Mm -hmm. And uh, particularly me, I'm the village idiot of Flight Brothers FT. I came in with like no knowledge whatsoever. And um, yeah, I feel for you because I mean, these things are not really self-evident. And after the fact, they seem kind of obvious. But if every aircraft, for example, has uh, your VHF COM 1 on, it would certainly not occur to you that you might need to turn it on when you suddenly get a ship that doesn't have it on. So that's, uh, you know, system depth, double-edged sword for us. And, and, you know, Tim, let me take a real quick detour, and then we'll come right back to some more um, oddity features, if you will. Um, the Meridian from Carinado, if you dial it to 121.5, mm -hmm. you'll hear an ELT. Nice. And I about lost myself for 15 minutes trying to figure this out, that it was selected on COM2. So, <laughs> again... You know, it's just sitting there making its noise for minutes, and I'm like, "What? What is that?" Lee I'm actually texted one. me because uh, he we were both tested. That was the, the video we did right before this one, um, and he texted me. He's like, "Were you getting this siren sound that just won't stop?" <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. I'm like, "No, I'm definitely not pressing the ELT switch. Like, it's definitely where it needs to be." What's going on? Oh, so, um, craziness. You know, another one of those. And again, one of the areas where SSG has really put these systems in depth is, and we addressed it in, I, I can't remember if it was this, I think it might have been our live stream, Tim, where we flew this to uh, Munich, maybe. Mm -hmm. It has tail strike protection. So when you're running down the runway and you yank back on that thing, the tail will not hit. The system sorts it out and will not give it, give it any more pitch Okay. Uh, then it needs to get airborne, which again is a feature that a lot of aircraft don't have, and surely is not modeled in sim. And right. another one of those unique to this for our 747, 400, 200 captains. This has FADEC on it, so you can throw your fuel switches and hit start, and you're done. There is no wait till N2 or N3, depending on if you've got, uh, you know, Pratt's GEs or Rolls Royces to add fuel uh you don't care throw the switch you know make sure your bleeds are on and go and it gives you on the icast you get the enunciator for the start sequence it'll say i think start or starting then it'll say running for about 10 seconds then that text disappears well this is interesting because where the sim world is reflecting the real world here um the 748 is it a common type rating with the 744 i would imagine it's not uh, because that tail strike protection sounds very similar. We're going to have to go check this now because that's the kind of dorks we are. To what MCAS was trying to do for the MAX uh, so the NG pilots would have a very nominal transition, just a little uh, computer-based training to get them into it. Because uh, if, you, if you are a 744 captain, you'll notice the cockpit's functionally the same other mm -hmm. than, yay, you have a FADEC now. So... The one thing that's not the same is the added length behind you. So, you know, the longer you make the ship, the easier it is to over rotate. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an issue on your 737, uh, 900. 
you know, look at look at a 300 model, a 200 model, then look at a 900. I mean, it's it's hard to believe they're related aircraft even. So that and, and you know be what that's all about. And I'd be curious if the well, and it's quite possible due to the systems automation, the A340, what was it, 800 or 600, whatever the the it was the world's longest plane, I think, nose to tail, right before the 747-8 came out. I would imagine it through the Airbus systems had some type of built-in strike protection as well. Of course it did. It was Airbus. Just push a button. Well, yeah, there you go. Hey, since we're kind of in the banner section here and we're, I guess, maybe trying to wrap it up, um, did you try and, can you preset a cargo view in the bay? Because you know how you can do it upstairs. You know, I think you can set one in crew rest and yeah. in the yes, intercontinental. You, you can. I, uh, I actually, here, it's a suggestion for everybody. Uh, if you already have it, when you get your eventual freighter in your update 2.2, I suggest you walk the cabin one time back to the rear cargo door and set a viewpoint back there. Uh, you set views by holding down control and then tapping a key, uh, any one of the numbers on your number pad on the keyboard. And then simply, so for example, control seven would set whatever your current view is to hitting seven on it. Mm -hmm. so, um, so since it's such a long walk back there, I set one view at the rear cargo door I set one view at the bottom of the uh, crew ladder down onto the cargo deck. And I think I set one uh, somewhere in the nose. So, so those are my three cargo deck views. But yes, you can set yeah. viewpoints in the cargo deck. Okay. Um, yeah, I hadn't messed with that, so. You might be able to set views outside the aircraft. Uh, I'll just give you a little trick here. You if, can. Okay. I can answer that one because I have some out the uh, top looking along the wings, uh, some of the pictures you've seen. Right. Actually, they're probably going to show up in this video. Um, so just, again, we're, we're kind of a little bit off script and chatting here now, but that's fine. So when you have an aircraft, if you've ever done that thing where you go to look left and you put your head accidentally outside the cockpit window. Yeah, it gets loud. And then you might find you have other aircraft where the viewpoint is uh, restricted, like you can't actually physically move things. Uh, you're like bumping into walls, or you might find you literally have to open the flight deck door to go further. On aircraft yeah. like that, I've had trouble setting external uh, views. But on the ones like uh, all the Carinados, I think pretty much you can kind of walk your head out the windows and stuff. Uh, and I have no issue on those setting external views. So hey, we're we're uh, I think we've pretty much tapped out the SSG with the exception of one thing. There are hmm. and have been complaints about the textures, and uh, we've really been trying to understand the, the the hatred we sometimes see for this aircraft because neither Lee nor I hated it. And now that's not to say we haven't had some issues, but. Certainly nothing that would make me like hate it or say, you know, hard pass, throw it away, trash. No, not at all. But uh, so looking around the flight deck, I found some textures that I considered to be subpar for SSG. Cause, so for example, good things. Outside, exterior texture is unassailable. It's perfect. It's amazing. You mm -hmm. can zoom in forever and it doesn't break down and pixelate. looks great. So sitting in the captain's chair I look overhead and there's I think a, a cutout and a speaker there and I really don't like the way it looks <laughs> I mean I don't like it at all and so I got thinking it's an incongruity issue if the whole thing looked like that speaker I would say these are weak textures blah I don't like it but since mm -hmm. we have like these immaculate textures some places and then like a kind of cruddy looking speaker over my head. I, I think it really bites us with the long haul crowd. Would you say that's that's kind of a factor here? Yeah, I think so because if you're sitting there for, you know, anywhere between probably six and 12, 15 hours, you're going to get bored and go look about the cabin. And maybe you're gonna nitpick those things. We, we know and we're well aware of some texture issues that SSG is aware of or working uh, so these may be on that list again 
in the description below, there's a bug tracker of items that they're working on and priorities that they have set to resolve. Now, it may be in 2.2, it may be in 2.3 or whatever, we don't know. We're just showing you guys a little behind the scenes of what this, uh, what this looks like at this point. All right, so um, we're just about getting to the end here. So we would really like to know, though, what your experiences have been with the SSG 748, if you've had either the V1 or the V2. Uh, but, but do us a favor. If you actually really dislike something about it, please let us know very specifically what it is. We're not going to ask you to defend it. Don't worry. I'm not going to razz you about it unless you tell me it handles like an F-16 because I already made fun of that earlier. But um, <laughs> but uh, if you actually have specific complaints, by all means, throw them down in the comment section, and uh, I'm, I'm certain SSG is going to be seeing this video, so that'll get it to us and probably them as well. Uh, one mm -hmm. other thing, before you ask us for a release date, we don't have that information. If you would like the most up-to-date, uh, you can always go check out FS uh, Elite or .net. That's a great site for all flight sim news. You can go to SSG to look for direct news briefs. Those would be your best sources of information. But uh, sorry, we don't actually know when it's going to drop. So until next time, I'm Tim. And I'm Lee. So remember, plan the flight. And fly the plan.